Hello folks, in a previous video I backtested a simple moving average system on the S&P 500 and these were the results that I got with it. Now I'd used a 200 day moving average because that was the setting recommended on Investopedia. But if you look online there's a whole range of different settings like 100, 150, even 250. So what should you use for your moving average? Well, I used Python to backtest over 200 different settings to see if there is a pattern to it. And I'm going to go through the code for it just now. I've already typed it all out, so I'll run it cell by cell and explain what's going on. First of all, I import the modules that I need, and then I define my start balance. This just gives me something to track as the system is executed. Next, I define my time range. So for this, I've chosen quite a decent size uh, sample size. So it's going to go from the start of 2000 all the way up to 2021. And now I can download the S&P 500 data for that date range. So you can see that's printed out ahead of it. So this is just the start of the data frame starting from the 3rd of January 2000. I don't need a lot of those comments uh, it's columns. So I can drop most of them and just leave the close column here. So before I go any further, let's just draw that onto the screen and see what the price chart looks like. And that pretty much is the S&P 500. You can see, for example, here is the financial crash and then the steady or more or less steady increase ever since then. So after that, I can calculate my returns and the benchmark balance for the S&P 500 as a buy and hold strategy. So the return here is basically just the close price divided by yesterday's close price. But of course, that would mean that on the very first day, I would get I wouldn't get a value because there wouldn't be a day before it to divide by. So I have to go back in with this here and just make sure that I set the return on day one to one. So there is no profit and there is no loss on day one. And then after that, the balance starts tracking. And you can see that although there's an initial drop from where the sample begins, by the end of this 20, well, 21 year sample, I've ended up with a profit, which makes sense. The whole thing has gone up over time. So this is where I do the actual backtest. I've created a function for it. Previously, I was able to just put these in individual cells and run them one by one so I could see the data as I'm processing it. But creating this as a function allows me to run it with any period in here. So this is what's going to allow me to run all the different ones and get results from it. But what's happening inside it is essentially, first of all, I calculate the simple moving average. And this is done based on this period variable or argument that's going to be fed into this function. So I've got the moving average. And then after that, I generate the long signals. And those happen anytime the price closes above the moving average. So essentially, when I draw the moving average over this, anytime the price is above it, that's when we're in the market. And anytime it goes below the moving average, that's when you exit. So with that done, I can calculate the system return. And for this, I use NumPy and basically just look at wherever there's been a long signal the day before, then I take the current return. If there wasn't a long signal, then we're neither long or short. So the return is just one. With the returns calculated, I can calculate the system balance much in the same way as I calculated the benchmark balance. I use the start balance and then I multiply by the cumulative product of the returns. And finally, I can track my continuous peak balance. And that allows me to calculate the drawdown. It's important to compare both the returns as well as the potential downside so you can get a realistic feel for this strategy and the outcome of it. And finally, all of this is going to create new series within the pandas data frame. But what I actually need to return from this function is just some metrics. So the metrics that I'm returning are the CAGR, the compounded annual growth rate, the drawdown, and this is just a risk adjusted return so that you can divide your uh, basically your upside by the downside. So the returns here are divided by the absolute value of your drawdown. And then finally, the function returns all three back. So I'm going to run this function just so that it's the code is executed and then I can start putting numbers into it. So first I want to backtest it with 200 because that is what I backtested it with previously. So if I run this code, I uh, should get the same, well, actually, I should get the same results from around here because in the previous sample, I went from 2015 to, sorry, 2005 to 2015. But this gives me the results instantly for a 200 day moving average. So that's fine. But now I want to test it over an entire range of moving average periods. So that's what this section here is doing. 
So first of all, I create an empty list which contains all the different periods. So it starts off with nothing in it, and then I add a range into it. So this is going to be the range of moving averages that I'm going to be testing. So I'm going to go from a period of 10, which is a fairly fast moving average, all the way up to 250 in increments of one. So basically I'm going to test all of the periods within this range. And then I've created a few more empty lists. So these are going to take the metrics that are returned back and store within them. So I've got the annual return, the drawdown, and then the risk adjusted return underneath. And then within this section, I can basically run that back test. So now I can iterate through each of these periods within this range. So I can iterate from 10 to 250, run that back test function with my price data, which is my overall data frame that I downloaded already, and then the period which is in this loop. So it's going to go with 10, then 11, 12, 13, and so on. And every time it runs, it will return the return, the drawdown, and the risk adjusted return, which are then going to be added back into those lists that I created. So by the end of this section here, which I'll run now, I'm going to end up, and you can see it executed very quickly, but it's going to end up with three complete lists that are going to correspond to each of those periods and their returning metrics. So now that I've done that, I can plot this out. So here, I first of all create a figure because I want three different plots all on top of each other. So I've got these three subplots. The first subplot is going to be just the return, then the drawdown, and then the risk adjusted return. And now this information here is basically showing me what's going on with these moving average periods. So these on the x-axis are the periods for the moving average tested. And you can see that for the lower ranges, uh, well, I only started testing above 10, but you can see that down here, the returns are pretty much non-existent. In fact, I think that's below zero, so it's a loss, and the drawdowns are massive. But then as the moving average period increases to a longer term one, then the returns and the drawdown also kind of move with it. And that's why I like having this third uh, graph here, which is the risk adjusted return, because if you just look at, for example, the annual returns, you'll see there's little little spikes here and here. So you may think that this is a good, uh, a good indication. However, you notice that the drawdown also peaks at those with those settings. And so the risk adjusted return kind of moves, moves all together with this. So in essence, it kind of shows the effect of both. Now keep in mind here that the drawdown is negative down the way. So the higher this graph goes, it's kind of the same as the others. The higher this graph goes, the, the better for the overall result. So this kind of does show that as you move towards the higher ranges, so 200, uh, well actually on this chart, you can see the 200 is here and that's the setting that I used. So it seems to actually be in a little dip and just either side of it, the settings are better. But it does kind of indicate that anything above maybe 170, 180 is going to give you the best results for this kind of method over this time period. So next, what I wanted to do was actually extract the best value. Now you can kind of make it out by just seeing by eye where the best might be. It's somewhere within these three peaks, but you can just get Python to return that value back because I know that what I'm looking for is my highest risk adjusted return. So I can just put that value back into uh, my lists here and tell me which index value that was at. And that's gonna tell me which period I got the value from. So if I run this, it tells me that 237 was the best. Now it may not be massively higher, but it looks like it's this one here. It doesn't look like there's that much in them, to be honest. So they're all kind of similar to each other, but that gives me the best results. So then I can re back test this. So I can run it again at that setting of 237, which is the optimal value. And then I can plot this out underneath. So I'm showing my close prices and the 237 day moving average overlaid on it. And then finally, I can show the benchmark balance, which is in blue here, if you had just bought and held the S&P 500 and then the system balance above it. So this is if you use the 237 day, which is the optimal value, moving average system. And this is the results that you get from it. Now, of course, doing it like this has a risk of curve fitting your, your results to your data. So uh, although I'm showing an optimal value, it's essentially it's optimized here and it may not work outside of this 
data set outside of the sample. But the main point of the exercise was just to show uh, and just to test what happens as the moving average increases. So it seems like the recommendations that you see online for this kind of moving average cross or moving average system do seem to be more or less in line that the higher periods do tend to work a bit better than the lower periods. So the 200 day moving average that I used previously that was recommended on Investopedia, well, based on this result, it might not have been the optimal value, but then this is just curve fit and optimized to this data set. So it may be in general that overall that is a decent amount or a decent period to use for this kind of strategy. So I hope this was a useful video and thanks for watching.